Welcome to the 2020 Public Health Law Virtual Summit. We have two presentations in this session and each presentation will have its own Q&A. Use the chat feature to submit your question and if you encounter technical difficulties during the summit, go to the navigation menu and select the Need Help button. Now I'll turn things over to Ben to introduce our speakers. Thanks so much, Charles. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining what I hope to be a very interesting and hopefully practical session today, the impact of federalism and preemption on local efforts to respond to and recover from the pandemic. I am going to share my screen to kick things off today. Thank you very much. So um, as I mentioned, my name is Ben Winnig. I am the founder of Think Forward Strategies, a, you know what, my slides are not, there we go, thank you. Here's our title slide and our speakers today are Derek Carr, Kim Haddow, Lindsay Wiley, um, and, and I am uh, moderating the session today. I'm the founder of Think Forward Strategies, it's a consulting firm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we're doing things a little bit differently today than uh, you may have experienced in an earlier session or uh, other sessions in the summit. While I did co-author the preemption chapter with Derek Carr and Kim Haddow and our colleague Sabrina Adler, for the next 60 minutes, I'll just be serving as your moderator. Uh, to save time for today, I'll be doing, um, excuse me, some Q&A, excuse me, to save time for Q&A uh, and a discussion, I'll be using the chat feature to share each of our speakers' bios and some of the recent writings and resources from each of the speakers and their respective organizations. We're gonna kick things off today with Professor Lindsay Wiley of American University, Washington College of Law. She's gonna be talking about federalism and what I am experiencing, and I'm sure you are as well, the really fascinating dynamics we're now seeing play out between the federal government and various state governments. I'll then pass the mic to Derek Carr, an attorney with Change Lab Solutions, to provide us with a brief background of preemption uh, then Kim Haddow, the director of the Local Solutions Support Center, will follow by sharing what she's learned from tracking the abuse of state preemption over the last several years and how the folks that have been most impacted by that abuse are some of the same people that are bearing the brunt of the health impacts from the pandemic. Kim and Derek are going to continue with their roadshow, kind of going back and forth, talking about and sharing their insights about state preemption and how it has played out during the pandemic and really get into some of the power struggles that we're seeing between states and localities and how those power struggles relate to advancing health equity. Before I call on Lindsay to kick things off, I do wanna just state what is per presumably the obvious uh, point to most of us in that what we really need to understand is that an effective response to COVID-19 really requires genuine coordination among all levels of government, federal, state, and local governments. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, instead, as I know uh, everyone has been witnessing, is both conflict and confusion. We're seeing conflict and confusion among federal, state, and local governments, and we're seeing conflict and confusion even among governments of the same level between cities, counties, and even, even cities uh, that share jurisdictional boundaries. And all of that has really stymied our, uh, the, the U.S. response to the pandemic. Quick reminder that if you're tweeting from the conference, the hashtag there is on your screen. And for those of you that have not yet or are interested in seeing the full report assessing legal responses to COVID-19, uh, you can do so at the URL on your screen, covid19policyplaybook.org. With that, I will turn it over to Professor Wiley. Lindsay. Thank you, Ben. I'm honored to be part of this important discussion. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on federalism and intergovernmental conflicts over both authority and responsibility for pandemic prevention and response. Uh, as most of you on the, on, in this session are already familiar with, in our federalist system, authority and responsibility for protecting the public's health is shared between the federal government, tribal governments, which Isla Haas will be presenting on uh, at another point in the conference, and the states, which typically delegate some of their authority to local governments. The federal government is limited uh, to the exercise of powers enumerated in the Constitution. In contrast, states have plenary police power to safeguard the public's health, safety, and welfare, and need not point to a particular delegation of authority uh, uh, in the Constitution when they act. 
Supreme Court precedents have interpreted limited federal powers, including federal powers to regulate interstate commerce and to spend for the general welfare quite broadly, making it possible for Congress and the federal administration to operate in domains of traditional state and local authority. And I'll just note that uh, later in the presentation, I'm also going to touch on some separation of powers issues, although Peter Jacobson is going to be presenting on those elsewhere in the conference, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, difference in authority between Congress and the federal administration. So recognizing the substantial resources and interstate and international coordinating authority that an effective public health response requires, Congress has granted the federal administration a wide range of authorities uh, pursuant to the enumerated powers of the federal government that the administration can use to prevent and respond to pandemics. And of course, Congress itself can act to expand these resources, expand these authorities uh, mid-pandemic as it has done uh, to a limited and insufficient extent thus far. But these legislative authorizations from Congress to federal officials and agencies are for the most part permissive and not mandatory. They state that federal officials may provide financial and logistical support, supply chain coordination, guidance and disease surveillance and epidemiological investigation services to support state, local and tribal governments. These permissive grants of authority don't provide a basis for holding federal officials legally accountable for failing to act. Instead, the only recourse available to respond to federal failures is political accountability through elections, as well as through political pressure that state governors, for example, might apply um, on the, the senators who are sent from their state to Congress to try to uh, uh, encourage, try to urge uh, greater federal action uh, as needed. In particular, federal officials are authorized but not obligated to act to prevent the spread of international um, uh, uh, communicable disease or interstate spread of infection across state and territorial lines within the U.S. Um, and in situations where state and local capacity is likely to be overwhelmed. These non-mandatory powers include providing critical supplies and financial resources um, in some areas, including approval of laboratories, medical tests, vaccines, and drugs, Congress has preempted state authority. Um, while in other areas, including travel restrictions, isolation and quarantine of individuals, uh, federal and state authority overlap. There's a real question, however, an open legal question about the extent to which the federal government has authority over social distancing and mask requirements that might be applied to the entire population on a nationwide basis under federal law, as opposed to the kind of patchwork response that we've been experiencing thus far. And I'll come back to that at the end uh, when I talk about CDC's recent boundary pushing eviction moratorium. So with so many overlapping authorities and responsibilities and some really pretty significant open legal questions about the boundaries between federal and state authority, it's unsurprising that interjurisdictional finger pointing has marked nearly every major public health crisis in recent American history and has been um, a really uh, prominent uh, uh, story throughout the current pandemic. Uh, federal and state conflicts over regulatory authorizations, uh, business regulations, controls on personal movement, financial support, and coordination of supply chains have stymied the U.S. coronavirus response. Uh, I think that might be the understatement of the year. Um, preventing a global pandemic from reaching the U.S. by stopping the spread of infection from international travelers and preventing community transmission from becoming widespread would have relied on far more readily accessible testing uh, than federal regulations, guidelines, and supply chain coordination allowed at the beginning of the pandemic in the early stages. By the time community transmission was detected in multiple US locations simultaneously, targeted strategies relying on testing and isolating infected individuals and tracing uh, and providing supported quarantine for their contacts um, were not adequately funded to contain the spread of disease, nor were critical supply chains adequately coordinated. As state and local governments entered the mitigation phase of the pandemic, most adopted restrictions, at least initially, on businesses and personal movement that exceeded CDC and White House guidelines. 
Yet when the public became restless, state and local leaders eased restrictions more rapidly than federal guidelines recommended. So we've seen this pendulum swinging effect um, that could have been blunted by more consistent uh, and more trusted federal guidelines coming from the CDC rather than uh, conflicting and inconsistent and mistrusted guidelines coming from both the CDC and the White House. At times, governors and other state and local officials have coordinated their efforts regionally, but for the most part, social distancing restrictions have varied considerably uh, by jurisdiction, resulting in what the Atlantic science writer Ed Young has coined the patchwork pandemic. Throughout the crisis, federal financial support, legal protections for employment, for housing, access to healthcare, and supply chain coordination have been needed but inadequately provided. Federal support is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient to implement widespread testing, tracing, supported isolation, quarantine of individuals, to enable people and businesses to comply with social distancing recommendations and mandates while minimizing secondary harms, to ensure widespread availability of adequate personal protective equipment for health workers, other frontline workers, and the general public, and to ensure widespread access to medical supplies and countermeasures based on equitable and public health-based criteria rather than political favoritism. The abdication of federal responsibility to support state and local efforts has exacerbated racial, socioeconomic, and geographic disparities in COVID-19 mortality, as well as in secondary impacts on housing, food, and economic security. The federal government is really the sole actor in the US with the financial resources and interstate authority necessary to implement a modern public health response. State governments are prohibited by state constitutions and in some cases statutory provisions from deficit spending, um, a constraint that is becoming ever more relevant, ever more pressing as state and local coffers run low. In the absence of a modern public health response supported by the federal government that takes advantage of available technology for testing, evidence-based mitigation strategies grounded in epidemiological evidence about where and how the virus is spreading, and a humane response grounded in a modern understanding about what respect for protection of and fulfillment of human rights requires, these failures have left tribal, state, and local governments fighting this pandemic like it's 1918 with saloon closures and cloth homemade face masks and a you're on your own mentality that relies on private charity as a woefully inadequate safety net. Can the current federal administration Congress or the next one turn things around? Absolutely, we know what's needed. We're seeing the results of a failure of political will and accountability, not a failure of ingenuity and know-how. The Senate could pass adequate funding to implement a modern response grounded in available technologies as well as equity and human rights right now. Right now, the federal administration could redirect available funds, reinstate evidence-driven guidelines for testing and social distancing, and deploy available agency authority to institute worker protections, housing protections, and more. More controversially, the president through the CDC could press the boundaries of statutory authority to, quote, prevent the spread of communicable diseases across state and territorial lines by providing for measures that in the CDC's direct, CDC director's judgment may be necessary under the Public Health Services Act, Section 361. A couple of weeks ago on September 4th, CDC issued its first order uh, pushing the boundaries of this statutory authority uh, to order a halt to evictions from residential residential properties, residential retail, uh, sorry, rental properties uh, through the end of the calendar year. This order pushes the boundaries of CDC statutory authority because that statutory language uh, is so broad to prevent the spread of communicable diseases, any measures, authorizing any measures that are in the judgment of the CDC director necessary to do so. It's vulnerable to challenge on the grounds that either Congress didn't intend to authorize CDC to act in this way, or if the authorization is indeed as broad as its plain language would appear, then such a broad delegation of authority would violate the constitutional separation of powers under the non-delegation doctrine because Congress isn't constitutionally permitted, so the argument goes, to give away legislative authority to an agency without providing more statutory guidance for the policy choices the agency is making. The CDC eviction moratorium order is now being challenged in multiple suits by libertarian organizations, landlords, and other groups.
court decisions generated by this litigation will have massive implications for the future of the federal government's role in pandemic preparedness, prevention, and response. The authority relied on for this eviction order, Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act, is the same statutory authority that could be used to issue a nationwide mask order, for example. And there could even be implications for federal regulation more broadly in areas as diverse as financial regulation and environmental protection. I'd be happy to talk more about the CDC eviction moratorium during the Q&A or discussion. For now, as a bridge to the next presentation, I just want to point out the CDC order institutes floor preemption. It specifies that state and local laws that provide more protection for public health than the federal moratorium does are not preempted by the federal order. They remain in effect. The CDC's authority under the Public Health Services Act, which Service Act, which the eviction order relies on, specifies that the authority Congress gave the administration to control communicable diseases under the PHSA may not be used to preempt state and local law except to the consent extent that there's a conflict between state and federal law, which would seem to be protective. Um, for public health intervention seem to prevent the kind of um, uh, intervention that President Trump repeatedly threatened to, to intervene and lift uh, state and local orders and restrictions. But of course, there, whether there's a conflict between state and local and federal law is open to interpretation. We should proceed with caution when we're talking about expanding federal authority over social distancing, mask requirements, and related public health matters, whether through legislative reform in Congress or through boundary pushing administrative actions like the CDC order. At various points in the pandemic, the president has claimed total authority to impose or to lift public health restrictions and mandates. So this is definitely an issue that the public health law community should be watching closely. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ben. Thank you, Lindsay, uh, very much. There was a few uh, comments in the chat box regarding some of the authorities that you relied upon uh, in your speech. And I don't know if you have those off the top of your head, but if that's something you could perhaps share, I did, um, chat out a few of the resources you've written and perhaps they're in there, but there was a desire to understand some of the legislative statutory, excuse me, statutory authority that you were referencing. So I just wanted to mention that. And you know what I, I can do is uh, I'll, I'll paste some references in the chat uh, during the next presentation. Fantastic. And before we go to Derek, I did want to ask one question about the eviction, um, uh, the, evic the eviction moratoria that the CDC uh, imposed. You referenced the Public Health Services Act many times. And you mentioned, well, that would be the authority that would, for, so for example, we'd have a nationwide mask mandate. Are there other types of policies that you believe the CDC either could or should be doing, given that uh, this kind of new interpretation within that act? Or are you wanting to wait and see until these lawsuits play out to, to see really where, where the boundaries are? So I hinted at this at the end of my presentation and we can talk more about it in the discussion. I'm really wary of expanding the federal role over restrictions and mandates aimed at social distancing. Uh, we've, what I'd much rather see is the federal government exercise its existing authority and responsibility to support that response at the state and local level. So even a nationwide mask mandate, I'm concerned uh, that, that if such an order were perceived as an actually imposed by, for example, a newly elected President Biden, that could actually have a backfiring effect. We've seen, you know, it has taken time, it continues to take time, but we've seen um, some success with kind of recent convert governors and mayors who are able to communicate more effectively to their constituents that they share their concerns, they share their resistance to face covering, but they've come to understand that it's needed. And I think that's far more effective than a nationwide mandate that would easily be seen as being imposed by Washington. Uh, the other possibility would be a spending condition imposed by Congress. Um, uh, it doesn't seem likely that the current Congress would do so, but a, but a kind of subsequent to a blue wave new Congress with, with new Senate leadership could. I still have the same concern, though, that something imposed at the national level uh, could actually be less effective, given that these social distancing and mask mandate orders are, even when purportedly mandatory, completely de dependent on widespread voluntary compliance. And so with that caveat in mind and the need to maintain the public's trust, I'm wary of pushing the boundaries of federal authority on that aspect of pandemic response. What I want is more support from the federal government for state, local, and tribal responses. Excellent, thank you. Very interesting perspective and I, I appreciate that very much.
Okay, I'm going to now um, share my screen again and hand it back to Derek Carr of Change Lab Solutions to uh, kick things off for his part of the presentation. Derek. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Lindsay, for that insightful presentation. So, uh, to start off, for those of you who haven't worked with us before, Change Lab Solutions is a national nonprofit located in Oakland, California, that advances equitable laws and policies to ensure healthy lives for all. Next slide. And just a quick disclaimer that nothing discussed today is legal advice and Change Lab Solutions does not enter attorney-client relationships. Next slide. So as Lizzie explained, and as we are all familiar, in our federalist system, government authority is of course divided at the federal, state, and local levels. And at its core, preemption is just a legal doctrine that allows a higher level of government to limit or even eliminate the power of a lower level government to regulate a specific issue. So federal laws, as Lindsay was talking about, can preempt state and local laws, and state laws can preempt local laws. Now, generally, a government can't do anything that conflicts with a higher level of government's laws. But depending on the specific type of preemption, lower level governments like cities and counties may be prevented from passing any laws on a certain issue, or they may be prevented from passing certain types of laws affecting that issue. Next slide. So just so that we all have the same grounding, I'm sure this is a review for many of you, we usually break down preemption into three broad categories. First, there's ceiling preemption, which occurs when a higher level of government establishes regulations and then prohibits lower levels of government from enacting any additional requirements or restrictions. So this can be thought of as setting maximum standards. Then there's floor preemption, uh, which Lindsay just referenced. And some argue that floor preemption isn't really preemption at all, but from a legal perspective, that's how we, we think about it. And uh, I think it's the right way as I'll get into a little bit later today. And floor preemption is best understood as when a higher level of government sets minimum standards on which lower levels of government can add additional or more rigorous requirements. But the lower levels of the government can't enact anything less rigorous or allow those within their jurisdiction to ignore the law entirely. And then finally, there's vacuum preemption, which is where a higher level of government doesn't establish any regulations of its own, but still prohibits lower levels of government from taking action to a, address a particular matter. And this form of preemption uh, often occurs in the context of broader deregulatory movements. Next slide. So why do we focus on preemption? What does it have to do with public health and health equity? You know, in the abstract, preemption is a important uh, legislative and judicial tool for resolving problems that arise uh, inevitably when different levels of government adopt conflicting laws on the same subject, or when having a single set of laws on a particular issue is necessary. But we also know that local jurisdictions operate as quote unquote laboratories of democracy. And as the level of government closest to the people, local government policy is often more likely to be grounded in a deep understanding of the health needs, community goals, and lived experiences of residents, and thus more likely to create the kind of lasting change that comes from responding to local priorities. And we've seen that local governments have been able to push for a variety of policy innovations that advance health equity, whether that's increasing the minimum wage, guaranteeing paid employment leave, requiring inclusionary zoning or expanding anti-discrimination protections. And as we're all familiar, the local governments really are the first line of protection for public health. And as we've seen with COVID, it's really critical that they have the flexibility to rapidly respond to emerging threats. But as Kimball will dive into in a little bit more detail uh, in just a moment, some state legislatures have increasingly turned to preemption as their tool of choice to prevent communities from enacting laws aimed at reducing inequities and enhancing community well-being. And most of these efforts have sought to prevent local governments from regulating a broad range of issues, and not because of any true need to resolve conflicts between different levels of government, but rather because of purely ide ideological opposition to particular policies. And in too many instances, it's been a majority white state legislature that's limiting the political power of people of color and other subordinated populations at the local level. And so while the misuse of preemption, whether at the federal or state level, always has a significant effect on public health or equity, COVID-19 has really shined uh, an even harsher light as it has in, in many instances uh, on the severe consequences that can result when the misuse and abuse of preemption 
undermines local government's ability to address the myriad health, social, and economic consequences of COVID-19. And it underscores those longstanding structural discrimination that has driven the stark racial and socioeconomic inequities that we see with COVID-19. So with that, I will hand it to Kim to dive into the preemption landscape in a little bit more detail. Thank you, Derek. Um, so bottom line is, is that I think folks know, as, as uh, Derek explained, that, with tr that preemption has been a tool in place for a long time. But what we have seen over the last 10 years since the 2011 sessions is really the use of preemption as a strategic tool deliberately intended to limit the local authority and independence of uh, local governments. Um, next slide, please, Ben. So what we're seeing is now laid bare the effects of that 10 years of deliberate uh, efforts to limit local lawmaking, limit local decision making. Um, and this has definitely hampered the local response to the pandemic. It has made it harder to protect lives and livelihoods. Um, and, you know, many of the preemptions that were in place that have been in put in place in the last 10 years, for example, uh, particularly paid sick days, um, equitable housing, minimum wage and broadband preemption laws have really forced cities to start from behind in their response to the pandemic. Next slide. So one of the things that has happened over the last decade is that we have seen an explosion in the quantity of preemption laws. So for example, in 2011, only one state, Georgia, preempted uh, paid sick days. Now we have 23 states. 10 years later that preempts paid sick days. So that gives you an idea of how this has become a go-to strategy and how widespread its use has been. So what we have now is in terms of starting behind in response to the pandemic, we have 33 states that prohibit some form of equitable housing policy. It can be source of income, it can be um, not in exclusionary zoning. Uh, um, you know, looking at rent control and rent stabilization laws. So looking at all of those preemption laws that affect uh, tenants' rights and tenant protections, 33 states are starting this pandemic where we see widespread concern about eviction um, and renter security uh, already behind the eight ball. Same with half the states preempt local minimum wage. Again, we're also looking at a lot of fiscal um, authority limitations. Almost all of the states have some limit on the, how local, authority, local fiscal authority can be used both to tax and spend. 21 states ban municipal broadband, which has really significant consequences at a time when people are being asked to go online for everything from work to voter registration to telemedicine, you know, to schooling. Next slide. So some of the characteristics of what we call new preemption, which is the preemption we've seen since 2011, is the effort to um, you know, preempt multiple regulations at once and the ability of localities to regulate in multiple areas at the same time. We call this Death Star deregulation or preemption. Basically, the best example of this is 2015 in Michigan, where one preemption law preempted nine workplace uh, provisions um, at once in one law. Blanket deregulation, we have seen many times, uh, particularly in, for in Florida, tried unsuccessfully, but it, basically these are laws that introduced that would limit local authority to regulate business pretty much writ large, all at once. Um, we've also seen a targeting of core local government functions in this new preemption, and by that I mean things that have historically been the, in the jurisdiction of localities, whether it comes to their own zoning, control over their own uh, elections, even in some places regulating how long a school board member can serve, a local school board member. So we're really seeing intrusion in areas that were traditionally walled off or cabined off for local government. We are also seeing punishment as a unique characterization, uh, character of uh, new preemption. And there are two ways that this punishment is it manifests. One of us on cities itself. So a threat to defund, a threat to take a city out of a queue for infrastructure investment, but basically punishing cities by withholding state resources. We're also seeing punishment directed for the first time ever um, to tar, you know, that's targeted to uh, elected local officials. And these punishments can be in the form of civil 
or criminal punishment. Um, we are also seeing a chilling effect. That means that there, and we are certainly seeing this play out in the uh, pandemic, where localities are concerned about triggering preemption or losing even more power. And so they are not taking initiative and they are not using innovation in ways that they would have before 2011. And then finally, the piece we want to spend a little more time on right now is that preemption has a uh, disproportionate effect on people of color, workers in low wage jobs and women. I mean, if you think about the uh, preempted policies we have just talked about, paid sick days, minimum wage, broadband, think about who's disproportionately affected by the fact that they don't have the access to these policies. Next. So the same people who are being hurt by uh, preemption are the same people who are being hurt by the pandemic. And I think this is something that's really been laid bare, as Derek said. And we can see that there is a structural effect here. So the victims of COVID-19 have been disproportionately black and brown. The people who have lost their jobs, disproportionately black and brown. People who have been forced back to work, black and brown service workers and laborers. And again, the people most hurt by state preemption, communities of color, workers in low wage jobs and women. Next slide. And I just want to share this. This is actually being updated today by the APM Research Lab. This, they, they try to update it every month. But as you can see, again, the groups that are most likely to have suffered and died because of COVID, are, again, are the same people who are suffering because of uh, the preemption that has already been in place. Derek? Great. Thanks, Kim. Uh, ben, next slide. So when communities have sought to redress the entrenched inequities that, that we are seeing, you know, many have found that, you know, due to the state preemption that Kim was just describing, their, you know, their zip code also dictates their ability to pursue more equitable laws and policies through their local government into action. Uh, you know, state legislatures across the country are using preemption with increasing regularity and brazenness to remove local authority over a number of areas. And these, you know, so-called new preemption laws that, that Kim described are particularly alarming from a social justice perspective because they, they fail to account for the potential health equity implications and impede local efforts to remedy historical harms. Next slide. But you know, despite these recent trends, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, preemption isn't inherently good or bad. It's not inherently adversarial to public health equity or even good governance. You know, preemption has the power to promote fairness and equity when local governments enact harmful policies, as they sometimes do, or when they simply fail to address systemic injustices. You know, federal civil rights laws, for example, uh, operate to preempt state and local authority. And even today, we know that there are state and local governments uh, who enact and enforce laws and policies that continue to perpetuate, uh, in some cases make worse, uh, racial inequities and other injustices. Next slide. So, you know, existing frameworks really fail to adequately account for this tension. Often the same legal arguments that would allow local governments to mandate fair employment policies like paid leave may also allow them to ignore or invalidate, uh, for example, state laws designed to increase affordable housing. And in the COVID-19 context, you know, targeted state preemption uh, can help protect public health and advance health equity when local laws, government officials, or community opposition stand in the way of an effective response, whether that's blocking testing centers or quarantine sites, or by lifting stay-at-home orders before state health officials determine that it's safe to do so. And similarly, state wide stay-at-home orders can establish baseline protections for all residents while allowing local governments to impose additional restrictions that address variations in local conditions. Next slide. And as with state preemption, you know, federal preemption can also sometimes either advance or impede public health and equity. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government uh, temporarily preempted state and local laws that restrict the ability a pharmacist do order and administer COVID-19 tests. And while that is a restraint on state and local authority, uh, it's also likely to ultimately uh, benefit an effective and equitable response by increasing the availability of testing, particularly in underserved communities uh, with limited access to healthcare services. But on the other hand, you know, federal preemption laws, many of which predate COVID-19, like preemption of state and local laws restricting mandatory arbitration 
clauses and employment contracts, as well as new proposals to preempt uh, certain state and local laws around liability have the potential to threaten those effective and equitable response and recovery efforts. So given that and given the overall landscape that Kim described, there are two things that become really clear. The first is that the overwhelming majority of state preemption occurring today is not only likely to harm public health and exacerbate health inequities, but also really represents a coordinated assault on the political power of communities of color, low income communities, and other structurally marginalized groups. But second, history also cautions against you know, unconditional local control, highlighting the need to preserve the ability for states or even the federal government to step in and preempt local actions that are likely to create or perpetuate inequities. So it's clear that preemption, you know, it's not good or evil, it's just a tool and like any tool, its merit really depends on how it's used and to what effect. Next slide. And before handing things back to Kim, I wanted to briefly note that you know, the public health community often you know, argues and takes the position that states should always set minimum standards that allow local governments to go above and beyond, but that it's rarely or never appropriate for states to establish a regulatory ceiling or even a regulatory vacuum. But this approach, contrasting so-called floor preemption against ceiling or vacuum preemption, also ultimately fails to capture the, the nuances uh, of, of preemption and can be susceptible to manipulation. And that's because while establishing minimum standards is generally favorable for, for public health by allowing lower level governments to adopt more protective laws for health and equity, that's not uh, necessarily always the case. So those opposed to, to local firearm safety regulations, for example, might frame state preemption as establishing uh, minimum standards for the protections of individuals' right to bear arms or groups opposed to the development of affordable housing might frame state preemption of local housing policies as setting baseline minimum protection for property owners. And we see this sort of, of misframing with, uh, with COVID-19 as well. The proposed COVID-19 legislation that the, the Senate just voted down had sought to shield businesses from state and local laws that impose civil liability for harms from COVID-19. And that legislation generally preempted conflicting state and local laws. But there was a carve out where the legislation also specified that it established quote unquote minimum standards for liability protections. That is rather than setting minimum health and safety standards, the legislation would set minimum standards on providing immunity from liability. And in doing so that legislation would have, despite preserving you know, some forms of, of local authority, uh, and state authority, it would have removed incentives for you know, businesses to proactively implement health and safety protections and the ability to hold those businesses accountable should they harm their customers or employees. And so while all, uh, it does so while purporting to preserve state and local authority to go above and beyond, it does so in a way that is ultimately likely to undermine efforts uh, to protect public health. And so the main takeaway that, that I want to impart from that is that you know, preemption laws really need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis for their likely impact on, on health and health equity and whether they're likely to advance or hinder those goals rather than you know, relying solely on uh, distinguishing between the different types of preemption involved. With that, I'll hand it back to Kim. Thank you, Derek. So taking a, a closer look at really how uh, preemption is playing out during the pandemic, uh, we have all been familiar with the t what, what we have seen. So there have been the definition of um, uh, what local stay at home orders are, masking uh, uh, conflicts over who has the authority to require mandatory masking, um, who doesn't, also with distancing. We're really seeing also the need to evoke emergency paid sick leave laws. This goes to the point I was making earlier, how folks are starting behind. We see the need to address evictions and foreclosures, as both Lindsay and uh, Derek have spoken about, how confusing this area is right now. Um, we've seen uh, efforts to increase access to emergency 
emergency broadband because so many states preempt municipal broadband um, and so much need is here during the pandemic. So we've seen states um, and localities really work hard to increase the access uh, and work around the preemptions that have been in place. Finally, we've even seen uh, the pausing of past laws. For, exi for example, Virginia has decided to pause its minimum wage increase that was supposed to happen this year to until next year because of the uncertainty of what's going on with the um, uh, economy around the uh, pandemic. Next. So as Derek said earlier, we have seen the different types of preemption play out during this um, pandemic. We've seen it really become a patchwork. So you have some states like Louisiana and Maryland where the governors did lay a floor and allowed local governments to add additional restrictions, to be stricter, to tailor their own, for example, opening start dates for schools, as opposed to issuing a statewide, you cannot do more than this. In other states where we've seen a lot of friction, Georgia, Florida, Texas, Arizona, which are also states where we see a lot of preemption occur across a broad range of policy issues. There has been real conflict between localities and states, particularly around stay-at-home orders, masking orders, um, you know, closure orders. Um, and basically, these are places that establish the ceiling and would not allow localities to do anything more than they would allow to protect protect the safety and welfare and health of their own uh, city citizens. Um, and then in some places like Iowa that did not ever issue a stay at home order, um, they still preempted local governments from acting. And so you have some places like Cedar Rapids that have acted in defiance of uh, the governor of Kim Reynolds. Um, and it's yet to be seen if there's going to be court action around that. So as Derek listed, we are seeing all these forms of preemption uh, floor, ceiling, and vacuum play out during this, this pandemic. Next slide. So the other thing we have seen is absolutely, so we talked about preemption that was in place before the pandemic and how it hampered recovery. What we've also seen is an increasing use of express preemption in the executive orders that uh, governors are issuing during the pandemic. So I've put a few examples here where you can see that, you know, in, in Mississippi, local governments cannot impose their own social distancing regulations or business shutdowns stricter than the states. South Carolina issued a similar order. Uh, Arkansas, same regulation, that regulations that would interfere with the essential operations of, and commerce um, could not be, uh, could not go do more than the state allowed. And then in, in Iowa, which again, as you remember, is a, is a case where the governor did not issue a stay at home order. She has also said that um, states must re, uh, schools must reopen 50% uh, in person. And so this absolutely upset uh, plans that were done in Ames and, and Des Moines and other cities that had already decided to open um, virtually. Uh, and so there is now a legal fight going on um, and basically, there was a ruling last week that said that the governor is right and that she has the power to force localities to open in person. Uh, An appeal on this is expected. Next. Next slide. So basically, one of the things we are concerned about um, and can talk more about is, so you've seen the consequences of preemption that's already in place, the need, for example, to figure out how to offer more access to broadband or to extend emergency uh, paid sick time to in states where it didn't exist. Um, and we have also just talked about the present where uh, express preemption is being added um, and, and, and indeed impeding the recovery effort, um, the response effort of localities. And now we are concerned about what we will see even going further into the recovery, and particularly, as Derek pointed out, how we would achieve an equitable recovery where all folks um, uh, to have an advantage here uh, in terms of uh, the laws that localities uh, can put in place to protect their health and safety. So, you know, we now have 48 states that limit local fiscal authority. This is going to be a real brouhaha, uh, frankly, because um, states and cities are both suffering. I think you know that there is a big effort right now in Congress to get uh, 500 uh, 
million dollars, half a billion dollars, um, $500 billion, sorry, to um, fund state and local governments um, who are out of money. You know, we have seen the effect of local uh, loss of local taxes um, and a need to, and again, folks are already cutting services because they do not have the money to maintain government employees. Uh, we have, as we said earlier, equitable, equitable housing policies are already preempted in, it should be 33 states. Um, we, have, we are concerned about city bankruptcies. I think what you saw with Flint, um, emergency managers and state takeovers is something we could see a lot of that, that we are very concerned about in this recovery and preemption realm. Uh, the debate over who has the power to determine when a workplace is safe and what those um, safety precautions should be. I think we're already seeing a fight over that. And certainly we are seeing efforts already, particularly in Texas and Florida, to limit the emergency powers of localities as they move into their legislative sessions in 21. We are very concerned about what's going to happen with vaccines. Right now, it looks like municipal um, governments have authority over vaccines and who is required to have a vaccine, for example, school children. Um, but we are very worried about um, state preemption in this area. We're already seeing state preemption around elections and voting, particularly or in places like Texas, where there was an effort to help folks um, who, who were concerned about contracting the virus not have to vote in person. Um, so we're seeing all of that play out in a voting um, realm also. And then frankly, we're concerned about what's going to happen with corporate liability and efforts to limit municipal litigation. Um, we are already seeing uh, bills that would increase, you know, that would not allow um, corporations to be held accountable for COVID-related illnesses, um, and also efforts to really restrict the suits that local governments can bring. Um, ben, back to you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one more. <laughs> uh, we have preemption in the pandemic. We actually think that there are some ways that localities can fight back. Uh, clearly, we've seen efforts to suspend preemption. We have already seen some efforts to repeal preemption. We expect to see more efforts to repeal preemption, particularly around um, emergency, uh, I'm sorry, emergency powers, paid sick days, um, and really looking at broadband preemption. We think that we're going to see um, some advances there, frankly, and some rollbacks uh, and return of power to localities. We actually hope to see some bills that will uh, affirm or expand local authority, depends on what happens happens with the legislative makeup after November 3rd. And frankly, we are working hard to actually have a uh begin a conversation about long-term structural reform around home rule. Frankly, the last time that home rule was really looked at and the framework for city powers was in 1953. A lot has happened to cities in the last 70 years, and this pandemic has really made it clear that there is a misalignment between state and local government power, um, and, and that actually has a life and death consequence that uh, has made it clear that this reform needs to take place. Ben? Thank you, uh, Kim and Derek and everyone. Um, we're going to now um, start the formal Q&A session. I know there has been a raging discussion on the chat uh, function regarding uh, legal authorities and thank you to Lindsay for sharing all of those. Um, I also note that the technology did not allow me to cut and paste some of the resources from um, other, uh, from all the speakers. So I'll, I'll be doing that shortly. I did see that Derek uh, posted a new resource from Change Lab Solutions uh, regarding a new tool toolkit on preemption for local policy campaigns. And I want to highlight that the Local Solutions Support Center also has an entire page on its website for COVID-19 related resources. And in particular, Kim has been following all of the state and local um, conflicts and updates regularly, something that's called at a glance, to give you a real sense of some of the dynamics that are going on between state and local governments. So shortly, I will also post those into the chat function. Um, let me start off with a question for Kim, and you actually just were getting into this uh, towards the end of your presentation, thinking about some of the, some of the um, future things you're looking at. Um, I was curious about some of the things that you may have missed. I know that you and the Local Solutions Support Center spend a lot of time trying to figure out, uh, okay, where's the next battle going to be? Where's the next hotspot going to be? And um, I, for one, for example, didn't foresee masks to become the issue that they are. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if there's a, anything that you're particularly surprised by, maybe mass is one of them or something else, and uh, 
where you think the field should be focusing on in the next you know six to 12 months well, I think mass is a good ex example. And frankly, I mean, you know, this may be naive on my part, but I was frankly surprised at when you have, I mean, if you particularly look at the, you know, I think the case that most people know about, which is uh, at the Atlanta mayor, um, you know, uh, being taken to court by um, the governor of uh, Georgia, Governor Kemp, you know, in an effort to, so that she would not have the authority to impose mandatory masking or to roll back some of the openings that she ha that had occurred in Atlanta. And so what's been surprising to me is, wait, these are steps that would increase protection of local health um, and, and protect people. Why would a state preempt this? And particularly, you know, when you, they're not going to do it themselves. I mean, this is, we've seen this over and over again, but around things that aren't such an issue of life and death. Often we see preemption by the state um, of things like minimum wage, where the state actually has no intention of raising the minimum wage itself and doesn't want localities to either, so driven politically. But this has been, frankly, a bit of a stunner. Why would you not allow a mayor, particularly in a majority black city, which is a, you know, a population disproportionately affected by the virus do more to protect our own citizens that's been a bit of a shocker frankly i will also say the debate over you know what constitutes an essential worker i mean you know it has been all over the place if you look at arizona i mean people who opened who had nail salons were defined as essential workers i mean this has been totally a surprise about how governors have de had have defined what essential workers are and then i would say the final thing is is that i am um you know, basically very worried about how this goes forward, because I think that what we are seeing is, is that in places where preemption has been used as a tool, it will increasingly be used as a tool. And so where it has been very clear that localities within a state are all experiencing a different kind of preemption, I mean, I'm sorry, a different kind of pandemic, and they need the ability to really be responsive and adroit and have their own independence. I'm very worried we're going to see even more handcuffing in some places, particularly like Texas and Florida. So those are the trends I'm worried about and didn't see coming. Great. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, there's a question regarding um, some, um, how courts have treated different types of preemption. And why don't I start with Lindsay here and um, hand it over to Derek if, if helpful. The, the question is, how have courts treated the different types of preemption and is there one type more often to be upheld or repealed? Lindsay. I'll just say really briefly that the starting point for preemption analysis in the courts is always what the legislature intended, whether the, whether the uh, 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 federal Congress or the state uh, legislature or whatever the relevant body is intended to preempt authority in this way, but I'll actually hand it, hand it over to Derek and, and Kim because they are really the gurus in this area. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I think it's absolutely right, especially at the, the, the federal level. Um, you know, it's very clear. It depends on congressional intent, and there's you know little question about uh, the federal government's ability to to preempt state and locals as long as it falls within the, the federal government's broader scope of, of legal authority. At the state level, it it really varies um, both depending on the state and depending on the, the even the specific locality with, within a state. So, um, you know, in, in some states like California and Colorado, there are really strong home rule protections that give cities rights under the state constitution. And in those instances, courts are, are more forgiving and off, are more likely to uh, strike down state preemption laws that infringe on that. In other states like, you know, Virginia and much of the South, uh, you know, states have pretty much unlimited authority to to preempt local governments and so really the only time that those laws get get struck down is, is when they you know they go even way too far and start implicating um, you know constitutional rights like freedom of speech or anti-discrimination laws and, and, and racial classifications so I, I, I don't think that there's sort of a, a neat way to to break it it down as to, to what's more likely to be upheld or repealed and, and how courts have done it it's really all over the place but I, I also think that 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 question points towards a, a, a bigger picture consideration, um, which is that, that you know, public health rightfully often focuses on both the legislature and the executives in terms of changing policy. But the, the judicial branch plays a huge role in how those policies are ultimately interpreted and implemented and able to, to move forward. And so as we sort of have this building movement to push back and, and reestablish uh, you know, local authority over, over 
issues of, of health and safety, um, you know, it's important to really keep in, in mind and, and really think through how we uh, engage the, the judicial system with that. So that's everything from, you know, basic education of judges on preemption and, uh, you know, its potential impact on, on health and safety to, you know, appointing judges, especially at the, the state and local levels or electing them that are, are more receptive to arguments favoring local authority. Of course, the, the federal courts are a little bit stacked right now, but the, the, the great thing with, with state courts is that, you know, as long as constitutional rights aren't implicated, uh, pure questions of state law are likely to be um, decided by, by state courts and not federal. Um, and then also performing, you know, legal doctrine, which is, is not uh, an issue unique to preemption, but certainly there, you know, thinking about disparate impact uh, litigation and how that has been chipped away over the last, you know, half half century and, um, you know, really reinvigorating civil rights laws and, and reinvigorating, um, you know, disparate impact as a, as a theory and, and uh, path um, in, in a greater number of areas beyond sort of the the, the areas that we still have right now of, of housing and, and anti-discrimination laws. And so I think the, the judiciary needs to, to very much be a, a co, as a co, it's a co-equal branch of government and it needs to be a co-equal focus of, of efforts to, to push back against um, the misuse of, of either federal or state preemption. Kim, anything to add there? Eric covered it. Um, there was another question uh, regarding vaccines and I saw that um, Lindsay uh, responded just now in the chat function. Um, the question was about a concern about limiting the requirements for mandatory vaccines and what um, you all think about that. Lindsay, do you want to kick things off since it sounds like you have some background here and then um, I'm happy to chime in or Kim, you, you, you can as well. Yeah, so um, I mean, there's certainly potential for Congress, for example, to attempt to more broadly preempt uh, state and local authority over vaccination. I actually think the more likely scenario, though, I don't imagine, I don't think it's likely that Congress will wade into uh, that that uh, uh, politically charged morass. I think um, what I what I think is more likely and and concerning is that. Um, uh, HHS and executive actions in recent years purporting to enhance uh, the religious liberty and conscience objection protections for health workers specifically could play a role uh, in limiting the authority of uh, employers in the healthcare sector, particularly from imposing a vaccination requirement as a condition uh, of employment. Um, and could also potentially stymie state and local efforts to impose a vaccination mandate for health workers. And it's important to keep in mind, you know, I really think this is going to be the biggest uh, issue in, in, in mandatory vaccination is around health workers, frontline workers. It could also go beyond health workers and include, for example, teachers and others who are understood to be frontline workers whose work is critical to, uh, to kind of returning to some semblance of normalcy or reopening. Um, but health workers, I think, will be first, uh, first in line. Uh, and uh, we tend to think of health workers in terms of like ICU physicians or, you know, highly skilled and highly paid workers. But we'd actually be talking about some quite disempowered, low wage uh, uh, health workers, um, many of whom would be highly skeptical of a new vaccine. We know this um, from, from empirical research. Um, and that that uh, that workforce is also disproportionately made up of women of color um, who have an what I often refer to as an educated skepticism uh, toward vaccination and any kind anything that's perceived as government experimentation and a perception that it wouldn't be undertaken with their health and their safety and best interests in mind. Um, so this is an area where that 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 conscience protection at the federal level um, could potentially conflict. Uh, with employer, private employer policies, and state and local laws. And certainly similar uh, religious freedom restoration acts at the, the state levels that have been interpreted even more expansively um, could be used to fight local uh, vaccination requirements. Uh, Kim, anything to add to that? I know we were just having this discussion. You, you know uh, more about saying. it than I do, Ben. You add if you'd like. Yeah, no, I think, I think um, Lindsay really covered it. Some of the ethical considerations around what a mandate might look like and who would fall into the categories of, of priority, I think are really important. There are um, a lot of people thinking about that right now. And I think we know from both our current politics that there will likely be a vaccine in the near future. And 
whether or not is it effective uh, or safe is a real question that I think all of us need to be need to be asking, um, and particularly when you get into vaccine mandates. I know there's just a there's just a minute or two left, so I'm going to hand the floor back over to the speakers for any closing thoughts. Um, and if there isn't any, um, we can give people 60 seconds back of their day. Um, so why don't we go around as it, as it appears on my screen, Kim Haddow and then Derek and then Lindsay for just any closing comments. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Likewise, and uh, feel free to, to reach out and I'm sure that offer stands to, to Kim and, and Ben and Lindsay as well if you have questions that weren't answered here or have, have questions about anything else in, in this realm. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. And I'm easy to find. I'm at Wiley at American.edu. Feel free to reach out anytime. Take care. Take care. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll hand it back over to Charles to close us out. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And thank you all um, for attending today's session. That concludes it. And please press the button underneath this video feed and pathful to take the evaluation for this session. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.